Hi everyone. Thanks for coming and uh, waiting for us to sort out the screen there. Um, we'd normally start this talk with the definition of FPC3, but Robin and Eugene beat us to it and probably did a better job. Um, so we'll jump right into it. My fellow FTC3 maintainer, Rico and I, are going to talk about the latest version of FTC3 2.0, how we got to where we were when we started planning it, what actually went into it, what you can now do with it, and then hopefully we'll spend a few minutes on what's already underway for the next version. Now, if you came to the keynote earlier, you've already heard my why FTC3, but let's throw the slide back up again and take another look at it. FTC3 is first and foremost a standardization effort. Right? When it came about, there are already multiple products that do what it purports to do. Um, they're solving the same problems. I don't just mean containers, um, desktop agents like the list Eugene gave, but I also mean like messaging buses and other integration tools for .NET frameworks, Java frameworks, etc. Anything that is used to enable apps to talk to each other directly. Um, by the way, FTC3's term for thing that helps apps talk to each other is desktop agent. I think you've heard it a few times, but we're going to use it quite a lot. Now, the value of the desktop agent and the FTC3 standard as a whole, of course, lies in the fact that the Financial Desktop Connectivity and Collaboration Consortium, and that's my annual attempt to say that whole thing, <laughs> <laughs> have come together to, to create it and adopt it together. Um, so there's a single API standard um, that everyone's using, and that's important for a bunch of different reasons. Uh, whether you're buying one in and using it, or whether you're designing and building it yourself, you, by using the standard, don't have to reinvent the wheel. I think um, Matt Barrett from Adaptive spoke about that last year, just how much they're seeing it speed people up in you know, not having to have the arguments about how you can approach it, Ooh, including the microphone, um, <laughs> but just getting on and doing it. So you can also avoid the vendor lock-ins, um, so both for the desktop agent and the applications. They're, they're all working in a standard way, so you can drop in a different one, rebuild your desktop in a different agent, drop in different apps to replace different pieces of it. In exchange for that, the vendors can avoid the single-use customizations, those, those things that slow, da slow down that cycle of acquiring an app, getting it deployed on the desktop. It don't, you don't have to negotiate, you don't have to... Um, just do it and throw it away. You can give it to the next client and the next one and the next one. And because it's a successful collaboration between lots of different stakeholders, it's had lots of scrutiny. It does things in the right way and it does them in a very sort of clear, easy to understand way. So um, it's relatively easy for your developers to pick up, unlike some other standards that I'm sure you've all used and I think we've mentioned at least once or twice today. So you might ask, if FTC3 is so successful, why did it need a major revision? And by major revision, I mean we're rolling that first digit of the version number, which is sort of conventionally done when you're breaking something. You're making breaking changes. Other people are going to have to make changes, um, which is something you try, particularly as a software vendor, you try and do very, very carefully. Now, there are a few reasons why it was necessary. And Rico's going to help us out with some of those in a minute by looking at some of FTC3's history and how we got to where we are. But to give you my take on it, basically standards are quite hard to do. Um, there's a lot of different people involved. There's, um, everyone has to agree, so there are lots of different opinions. There's compromises to be made, etc. And with any design project, anything that you're building for the first time, you're going to learn things about it when you try and use it, and you're going to want to end up changing it, refining it, honing it. FDC3 is no different. So, knowing all of this, the FDC3 community has taken a relatively conservative approach to building that standard. And we're pretty conservative about uh, both additions to it and changes to it. We kept the standard simple with a very tight focus on app interop, not every different function that you need in a desktop container to put an app on a desktop. We could have gone there, but it wouldn't have made for a it wouldn't have been feasible to try and standardize every possible thing. So it's, it's very tightly focused on just how the applications launch and talk to each other. That's ensured that the creation and the maintenance of the thing is actually feasible. And it has also been a key part, I think, of it succeeding in its main goal, which is delivering that vendor independence in those desktop workflows. The strategy has been successful. I mean, this is not the first of these logo slides you've seen today, and it probably won't be the last. 
Um, but basically, as um, the guy showed a minute ago, it's being used across the industry by lots of different people. Um, to start with, it was like very heavily focused on the sell side. Um, organizations had big app development teams, etc., that could afford to invest in that interop. But we're, we're working with um, a number of different buy sides who are getting really interested in it. Lots of vendors have been popping up the last year. I can see several of you here today. Um, so all of these different groups are starting to work together to actually cooperate to do what they're they need to do, and as I said, it's making life easier for them doing that. So much so that it's clear that the FTC3 has a strong chance of becoming ubiquitous on a financial services desktop. You will see it on all of them, we hope, in the next year or two. And as I said earlier, all this exciting usage founded on FTC3 strengths revealed a few places where the standard could go further, could be better. And with it rapidly approaching that critical mass where everybody's going to use it, making breaking changes is going to just get harder and harder for us to do. Um, hence, we needed to seize the opportunity to change things before it got too difficult, which resulted in a 2.0 this year. So before we get into, cha into what changed, I'm going to hand you over to Rico, who has been an FTC3 maintainer for a hell of a lot longer than I have, um, has helped birth this thing and carry it through its first three years. Uh, first few years while I've picked it up as a teenager and tried to uh, help it along into adulthood. Um, but he's going to tell you a bit more about how we got here and what we needed to do. Cool. Hey, everyone. Do I need this mic or can you hear me on this one? That, that, that one's good. good. Okay, cool. I'm going to put it down then without... Yeah. Okay. Cool. Uh, so yeah, I'm uh, I'm Rico Eckstein. Uh, I am the head of desktop strategy at Adaptive Financial Consulting. Um, I was also the lead maintainer of FTC3 before they fired me, um, and and, uh, and and Chris is now doing a much better job than than I could. So it was the right decision. Um, I'm still a maintainer though. I'm, I'm still involved, and I and I love FTC3, and I love being involved. Did go to my next slide? Okay. Cool. So, um, who here loves XKCD? Right, it's my, one of my favourite web comics. Right, and so I'm gonna like so many, well, like almost all innovations. FTC three started out of problems and frustrations that people had. Right, um, and this is, I think, probably one of the most well known um, XKCDs when it comes to standards. Right, this idea that. Uh, you know, like you notice there's lots of different ways to do things and okay, let's standardize it and and now you've got another different way to do something, right? Uh, and, and that's how people tend to think about standards. But FTC3 is trying to be a little bit better than that. Uh, and this is my my other favorite comic as in the context of FTC3, which kind of explains a bit more about the interoperability side of it. And it's called the sandboxing cycle. And it's this idea that, um, you know, uh, we've got lots of different things that can't talk to each other. Wouldn't it be great if ooh, I did the same thing as Chris, if they could, <laughs> right? Um, and then everybody's like, oh, now we've got lots of security issues and bugs, so we need to separate everything. And you, like, we've already had questions here today about security, right? So, so it, it, it keeps going around like that. Right, but I, in pre preparing for this talk, I've now find a different XKCD comment, comic, which is now my favourite way to describe FTC3, and it's this one, right? Um, so, so this is like the universal converter box, right? For all, and and this reminds me so much of the finance industry, right? Because we've got the buy side, we've got the sell side, we've got all of the vendors, uh, and everybody is doing things in different ways, right? And what we hear from everyone is we want a universal converter box so that we can bring all of these things together, right? And that is what FTC3 is trying to do. So for the universal con converter box, see FTC3 desktop agent, right? Because that's, that's it, okay? So looking a bit at the history, in 2017, uh, Nick Kolba from uh, OpenFin uh, he cr created and had the vision to start FTC3 as an open way for this type of collaboration to happen. And then in 2018, the Symphony Software Foundation became FinOS. And a month after that, OpenFin donated 
uh, FTC3 to Finos, and it was one of the starting projects of Finos. So we've been sort of part of that from that point. And, um, Chris mentioned that I'm part of the furniture. I got involved in 2018 at that point as well when we started forming working groups to create FTC3, right? And when we started FTC3, like there was four separate, well, actually five separate working groups. One was for APIs, one was for um, context data, one was for intents, one was for um, app directory, and then we also had a use case working group. So these were sort of separate groups working together on separate standards in a way for all of those various aspects of interoperability. And if you've used FTC3 and you've wondered about why there's four separate specifications, but there's one standard, that's why. It's purely for that historical reason. Um, and yeah, I was involved in shaping the 1.0 release of those four specifications. And, um, you know, in, in June of 2019, we first realized, like, actually, this context and intent stuff is actually all related. So people are working at cross purposes. Let's throw it together. Um, you know, and that's also when we started hearing about people like we need proper communication channels between applications. And that became a very big part of the scope and roadmap for FTC 3.1.1, which was released in 2020. Um, you know, and, and after that release, you know, there was the further realization that actually we've got lots of different meetings, lots of different groups. And it's kind of the same people involved in all of them. Let's bring it together into one standard working group. Let's all work together with the same goals, make sure things don't overlap or confuse between different parts. Um, and, and, and that's what we did then. And, and that's when we started working on the next version of FTC3. And we very quickly realized that there were some smaller things and some bigger things that people were asking for and needed. And we needed to kind of tackle the big things, but before we can do that, we should do some of the smaller things that were quick wins. And that's what went into FTC3 1.1, uh, sorry, 1.2, including our NPM package, which was something that I was quite <coughs> passionate about that we should have to make it easier for people to adopt. And we released that. And then we started working on FTC3 2.0 and we found out it was really hard <laughs> because there was lots of big things, um, lots of discussion, con um, contradiction, different opinions about how we should do things. And um, that is when we realized we need to start these discussion groups for different topics in FTC3 to tackle all of them. But then it comes back to the standard working group uh, to make the decisions. And uh, we also started a spec rewrite, which I'll say something about in a moment. Chris will mention it as well. Um, but long story short, we're at the point now where we have the 2.0 draft. It's loads of work. It's by far our biggest release ever. So, um, so that's just a bit of a where we came from. Um, and I'm going to breeze through these. This is like what went into the previous releases. You know, I've kind of talked about it already. Um, you know, but. I think the important thing is after that first four specifications, we started getting people adopting it and giving us feedback about what, we, what, what they need right from the start. And you know, we standardized some types, we made it easier to consume those types, we, we added channels, and then in FTC 3.1.2, you know, we added some new functionality, we had better support for applications in figuring out when FTC 3 is ready, um, how to deal with me metadata and things like that. I mentioned the NPM package. So I want to stress this is by far not the only way that people consume FTC3. Right, FTC3 is a standard. It's technology agnostic. You don't have to use JavaScript or NPM or anything like that. But looking at that graph gives me a nice warm fuzzy feeling in my stomach, right? Because it shows people are using it. In May of this year, we had 500 people download the package in one day, right? And it's, it's a, a sign that we're doing something right and that we can continue building it and continue making that graph point upwards, right? So uh, what were people asking us about? What were some of these big things that we had to tackle? Well, um, the 
they were saying, like, how can I have intents that return data back? You know, how can I target a particular app instance? What context and intents should I use? There aren't enough. Like, how can I publish my app easily? How can I make it work over uh, across different containers? Lots of people, including Chris and myself, were like, there's lots of ambiguities in the standard. This thing that there were four and now there's one and like it's confusing, we need to fix that. Um, the, the people were saying us like we need to clean up some of the APIs. Um, you know, how, how can we ensure each desktop agent will work the same? We need more examples and tools. Like all of these things we were hearing from people and it was kind of daunting to figure out how to cover all of them. And that's where the discussion groups came in. Um, you know, and I've tried to draw over there how we kind of brought like all of these different groups together and into one standards working group. And if nothing else, it's a great window on how like developing a standard works and how dividing and conquering doesn't help in terms of actually getting somewhere. Um, and since version 1.2, like we've really, um, you know, focused in on the specific things we've been hearing from people. Like we had a channels and feeds discussion group. That's in 2.0. Chris will mention more about that. You know, we, for the app directory improvements we needed to make, the context data and intents we needed to add. You know, all of these things was what enabled us to get to version 2.0. And um, yeah, over to Chris who will share more on that. Okay, thanks Rico. Um, I'm happy to report that through those discussion groups, the standard working group meetings, of which there have been a lot, if you've tried to go to all of them, there, are, there have been a lot of them this year, we've achieved the roadmap, and then some. In fact, it went so well towards the end of the process, one of my colleagues who's been involved with FDC3 um, since the beginning got in touch to share their feelings about the standard and how we'd been doing the work we've been doing in those meetings. And they did so by sending me this image, which um, is often referred to, the, to as the technology adoption life cycle or innovation diffusion life cycle. It's used to illustrate a key challenge for the adoption of any technology, um, which is crossing what they call the credibility gap or the chasm. Um, the chasm results from basically your mainstream market not necessarily tr trusting references from the early market. People have just tried, tried it out. Um, they actually, the mainstream market often needs to hear from members of their own cohort who are actually trying out and using things. And um, my colleague marked out FDC3 has very, as having very much crossed that chasm as evidenced throughout this year's work um, with lots of main market participants coming along to the meetings, working with us, getting engaged with the changes we're making, coming to us outside the, the meetings and asking questions about when things would be ready. So it's a much larger and more diverse group than was observed during the earlier versions of FDC3, I think it's fair to say, um, making now quite an exciting time to be involved in the standard or starting to use it. Right, let's go on to the detail, and I'll, I'll rattle through this as quickly as I can. I know I stand between this, this whole room full of people and lunch, which is a dangerous position to be in. Um, but we'll start with the desktop agent, where for FDC3 from version 1 makes it pretty easy to send requests over to other applications to to do a thing. You do it by raising an intent, which the desktop agent will resolve. Um, it will send it onto another app. It might be just there's one app available, or it might show up a resolver allowing the user to pick an app. But ultimately, it will deliver the intent and context over there. And at the same time, it's going to send back an intent resolution to your app so you know where it went, that you actually found something and who's dealing with it. Um, it's very effective for triggering actions with context data in other apps, but as you heard from Eugene and Robert earlier, um, building workflows that involve retrieving data or reference back to the created object is difficult. It's not impossible, but it's difficult. So we needed to create transactions. We needed to be able to request a thing and get something back. So FTC 3.2 improves on earlier versions by giving you support for that. It's achieved by allowing that intent handler from our last flow to also return a result. So your application receives back your intent resolution, and then you can wait for a result to arrive. 
that other application is probably not going to send it through straight away. It might be that they need to pop something up for a user to confirm, like Symphony might want a human being to look at the message before it gets sent, or you know, an order form might pop up pre-filled, but human beings got to be in the loop to actually process it. So we've had to design a system where you can get your deferred result back, find out what the order ID was, or the reference to the chat room that just got created. If rather than a single response, you needed a stream of them, your app can also return a channel as its result. Um, so on the other side, the desktop agent makes that channel immediately available to the app. Here's what they've sent you back. And then as soon as you connect to it, um, either side can start streaming messages at the other. So they've got a nice private link between them to exchange some data. Um, it's for you know some form of data feed and quite often you need some sort of life cycle support for data feed so you don't necessarily want to start streaming stuff to something until there's somebody listening on the other end so we had to introduce a new channel type that allowed you to synchronize that feed start it up clean it up when the person has gone away so you're not just streaming data at an empty room it also uh, comes with the requirement that it's a private conversation so unless the app decides to give that channel out to another application, it, you know, something else can't break in and start listening to it. Now, enabling real data exchanges mediated by the desktop agent allows FDC3 to tackle loads of new use cases. Um, for example, you can now create real API transactions just on the desktop, so creating an order in an OMS or a new room in a uh, in a chat app and receiving the details is, is a useful thing to do. <laughs> Essentially, you, you can now automate any form of CRUD operation that you need to do from one application to another. You can send it over there, get back the updated details. If you've just updated a record, you can have the updated record back and see it all, all merged. And you can carry on your workflow with, uh, with that data. You can also create APIs to deliver data feeds, such as pricing streams, streams of trade, streams of order details, updates, etc., customer activity, that can then be handed on to other applications to use. So a use case that's quite close to our hearts at Cosaic, which, um, which also builds Chart IQ, is plotting stuff on a chart. If it's easier for us to get a stream of trades or a stream of orders, etc., they can all be displayed alongside the pricing stream. And we don't necessarily even know, need to know what other application or what standard it's coming from. So. Other key changes in the API include making FTC3 aware of individual instances of applications. If you open an app or raise an intent with FTC3, it will uh, now give you a reference to the one that you've opened so you can start targeting it. Um, again, for example, pricing charts on a sales trader's desktop, they're going to have three, four, five of the same thing open. If they're working three, four, five different orders. It needs to be able to go to the relevant one um, without having to pop up a UI for somebody to drive it all the time. Um, we've also added the optional ability for intent and context messages to come with metadata for the app or instance that sent them. As I said, um, when something resolves an intent for you, you find out who who it is, but it's quite nice for those applications to know who's asking them to do something. Uh, so you now can have those details as an optional feature, um, which means, you know, again, they can target new workflows, you know, new messages right at the relevant people. Finally, we've also dealt with a huge amount of cleanup in the FTC3 API, such as standardizing on the app D's app ID field rather than the non-unique name field that people ran into some trouble with. We've standardized on async function calls for consistency and better developer experience. We've got better errors, descriptions of what they should be used for, along with a bunch of other clarifications that people have asked for on how to go about using the API. The channel support has also been improved. We've got a new name for system channels. Um, this is one of those bits uh, that we needed the experience of using it for. I've explained how channels work to dozens of developers at dozens of different companies, and they still they all want to know, why is it called a system channel? I don't, I don't understand. So we've, we've renamed it a user channel because it's the user who sets these things. It's, it's just a little bit more intuitive. We got rid of um, some older things like the global channel that was uh, there for compatibility with FDC3 1.0. And we've added a recommended set of channels as well, which will be uh, important for the future when we're starting to bridge desktop agents together and them having different channel sets, different colors will be a little bit confusing. Moving on to the app directory, we have spent some time 
reconfirming its role in desktop in interop and the FDC3 ecosystem. And doing so has allowed us to get on with significantly refining both the API and the application records it, it uh, serves. The goal was basically to make it fit for purpose for the next few years uh, for vendors to publish applications out to the rest of the industry. And it, that's a fairly critical thing for us to have got done um, when FDC3 is achieving such strong uptake amongst the industry. Um, we're, expecting, we're expecting to see a lot more of them soon. So at the same time, we trimmed the API calls down uh, to just what really was needed to standardize. So there was more in there than, than we needed. And uh, we did that in, on the assumption uh, or the intention that desktop agents should be connecting to multiple app directories. So for example, search endpoint wasn't necessarily a sensible thing to have if you were going to be searching across lots of different directories. And they all did it in a different way. Um, but we're expecting to people to connect to multiple app directories. They're in-house applications, ones they've got from two or three different vendors, perhaps some aggregated by a third party. I know uh, Venos harbors an ambition to host its own directory of FDC3-enabled apps that people will be able to pull from. And finally, we've significantly improved those application records, the things that describe the apps. So they now have support for multiple desktop agents, um, where previously they only really gave you the, the setup for one of them. Or you can go completely without the, the vendor-specific manifest and use some um, vendor agnostic launch details that have been added to it with the aim of ensuring that one record really works for everybody. We've better aligned with other standards, for example, the web application manifest. There are other people doing similar things. It, wasn't web application manifest wasn't right for what we needed to do, but they've done a lot of work there and we can draw from their best practices. Um, in fact, you can even reference a web app manifest now. Um, we have added support for browsing and search use cases. If you've got great big uh, app catalogs uh, powered by app directories, it's nice to be able to navigate them with categories or other metadata that just wasn't in our records beforehand. We now support native apps as well. FTC3 has always supported native apps, but you don't always launch a native app with a URL. You might be a path on disk or a protocol handler or various other ways. So we've added lots of things that you need to support those. And we can now do localization and accessibility. So you can have translations of the AppD records. They've got lots of free text in them describing an app. So if you deliver it to French, Spanish, and Italian clients, you can put it in there. And also, um, language was really important to accessibility. If something has a name that is, uh, should be pronounced in a different language, it's important to know what language that is for a screen reader. Uh, screen readers use a pronunciation dictionary. If they try and read French in English, it sounds worse than I do in French. So, that's saying something. So lastly, and probably my favorite change, is you can now use the app directory to describe how your app actually uses Interop. Now, I've spent time integrating uh, apps for people, they've implemented FTC3, but you have to go and get their documentation, dig through it, find the right bit, assuming they wrote it. If we put that in the records, your developers can just pick that up and go, oh, I need to send that intent with this context, and it works. It also means we can build um, app directory viewers and say, well, this app works with that app. It sends that intent and context, and this one receives that one, so just, you can pick up this application to do what you need to do. Now that it's ready, we're really hoping to see AppDs pop up all over the place across the industry as an easier way for people to deploy the software such that you can pull it down and weld it into a desktop. Now, after the two APIs, context data and intents makes up pretty much the rest of the FTC3 standard. Um, they are what's used to implement specific workflows, basically specific use cases. Anyone can make up an intent name. Anyone can define a context type. However, standardization of these is what's important. It prevents each firm having to do it themselves, create their own one, and it ensures that the apps are actually interchangeable. So if you've used the same type as somebody else, you know, on either end of um, the interop, you can then connect to them without having to do that uh, standardized, you know, having to do that integration work. So we have created a whole bunch of new workflows, um, or we've created standard types to support those workflows.
to help you do things like visualizing data, so you can now provide more detailed configuration to charts. You can find and share research with a view research intent. You can interact with an OMS, you know, view quotes, view orders. You can initiate communications with various applications, chat apps, um, your email clients, etc. You can interact with the CRM, view somebody's profile, view some interactions, or you could go ahead and initiate those communications as well. They'll log it in the CRM and they, in turn, will use that intent to pass it on and actually start the chat for you. So, the group has also improved the building blocks that are used to create those uh, contexts and intents. So, for example, we've got some context field type conventions. If you're putting dates, currencies, countries in, etc., there's a convention for you to follow, so we all do it in the same way. We've expanded the intent name conventions, um, which helps to promote consistency between the named intents. It makes them a little bit more intuitive for users, so they've got an idea of what's going to happen based on its name. Okay, I'm view a chart. It's going to pop up. I'm going to get. I'm going to uh, get a price. It's going to send me some data back. We've also created a bunch of uh, new context types for the smaller things, countries, currencies, time ranges, valuations, so they can be used to directly or to compose other types. And actually, before I head off this one, we've also got a brand new maintainer who's joined us this year, Vinay, who I'm going to pick out and embarrass in front here. He's running this group. Now, um, <laughs> which is a huge relief to me, uh, but it's going to be our longest running discussion group. This one's going to keep going between versions of the, uh, of the uh, standard because it's, you know, we can propose types between releases. You can start using them quite happily. So if you're starting to build workflows, come along, um, either, talk, either talk to Vinay or our colleagues at Finos who can invite you along to the meetings and you can come and uh, access some of the hive mind on how to go about building your context types and intents, how to make them successful, how to make them useful to other people who are going to pick them up. And finally, we ran a FinOS supported project to improve just the standard of the standard. So we're improving the documentation. Um, we had the help of a distinguished consultant editor that FinOS hired in for us, Rex Jeski, who has uh, been involved in numerous uh, standards. I think he edited um, the C sharp uh, specification until just this month. He's been doing that for about 17 years. And with his help, we finally addressed some of the integration of the separate parts of the FTC3 standard into a single set of documents. We've done some long overdue consolidation of the individual specifications and improved them. It's a lot easier to read. So if you've, if you've been in there in 1.0, 1.1, trying to find your way around, hopefully you'll find it a lot easier now. We better defined all of our terminology. It's backed by glossary, making sure we're being consistent about it. We've clarified compliance requirements for people implementing or using the standard, both the desktop agents and the app vendors. We've deduplicated the docs. We have found, you know, across this, this um, code base that forms the website, we were saying things three or four times, so they're now uh, a lot more dry, easier to maintain, easier to find your way around. And we've included formal references to external standards and trademarks and all the other things that um, you would normally do. We've also better documented our governance procedures so people can find their way around it. And we've done a fair bit of work on that governance, which is going to enable us to adopt a new license for FTC3, the Community Specification License, which defines its governance model, which we will be doing um, pretty much as soon as we get out of the conference. So, so with... 2.0 adopted as of the 1st of July, I think. Um, we're now looking ahead to 2.1. Um, we have the actual release to happen 45 days after the adoption, but obviously there's a bit more time after that as people have actually got to implement the standard too. But there is a huge amount of work that's already ongoing uh, for FDC3 2.1, not least of which um, is the desktop agent bridging discussion group that a couple of people have mentioned connecting those whole desktop agents. So if you're a vendor with a lot of applications and you're producing a desktop suite, you may want to ship that onto somebody's desktop who may also have their own desktop agent. So the goal of that group is for those two to be able to seamlessly connect to each other, authenticate each other so they know they're allowed to talk, but then for their apps that they manage just to be able to talk to each other without actually knowing anything else is going on. So it's a, it's a job for the desktop agents hopefully making life easy for anyone using 
all of the different applications. So if you're interested in that, if you've got uh, a desktop agent implementation, you're going to want to plug into another one, come along and talk to us at the group. We've also got, I've already mentioned, context data and intense group, expanding the lexicon. Um, so the, this current, currently meets monthly, but we have some breakout meetings as well as we're working on particular things. Uh, so I know at the moment we're working on context types for order, trade, position, and instrument. I can, I can pick out some faces here, I know, doing some of that work. Um, so we're looking to see, hopefully, to have those up and available for people to start using in the short term doesn't actually have to wait for 2.1, um, but they will be there. We're also working more intense for, for uh, chat, CRM, and OMS, EMS uh, interactions, and also just straight Q&A for people who are trying to do this stuff, as I mentioned. Um, come along and, and talk about what you need to do or what we should be doing for you, what um, workflows that you need to see standardized, what vendors you need to be able to interchange. There's also a whole range of other issues open. I'm not going to go into them all, um, but a couple of highlights. People have been talking to us about notification APIs. Lots of apps send notifications, and you want to action them, and that might not even be in the app that you sent them, in, that sent you the notification. So that's a natural thing for FDC3 to do. Uh, as a desktop agent vendor, we also put lots of apps in layouts, in workspaces, and they save their state. And that's a key part of apps actually working together, being part of the desktop. So we'll be looking at... Um, saving and restoring state calls, hopefully. Um, you know, whether the exposed uh, originating app identity metadata, you know, finding out where messages came from um, was something we were asked for late in the game, but a, a number of people think it should be required. It's a key part of working with another application, so we'll be looking at that. And then lastly, there is conversation just getting going about doing things with identities, both for apps and for... Um, individuals, not just validating, you know, logging somebody in, but also passing around a validatable identity for them. So they pass you something to say, I want to place this order, you want to pass it on to another application, you carry that identity with, with it so that uh, it can be authenticated. So with that, I'll pass you back to Rico, where hopefully he's going to tell you a bit more about how you can get involved. Yeah, uh, I've been willing, Chris, on because I'm very scared of that lady with the big red stop sign coming in and me not get, being able to do my bit. So um, just to make sure you're not scared of this, uh, I'm not going to talk for much longer. We'll all be able to go and have some lunch in a few minutes. Okay. Um, this part of the talk is the call to action, right? Uh, getting FTC 3.2.0 out, uh, you know, I, uh, context data and intents, I, I want to call out specifically at OSFF last year there was a bunch of us who started talking um, I think uh, the, the guys from RBC uh, Dom from ISH Smarket uh, and a few others of us and it was like oh, we need more conte uh, context data we need more intense right and we started a discussion group we started talking everybody started getting together and now almost all of those things the use cases that they want in around analytics things like that are in this release of the standard, right? So all of this stuff happens by the community coming together, you know, and now with Vina from Symphony um, taking over with the context data and intense group and, and really willing that onwards, you, you know, that just shows how we can gather momentum, how people in the industry can work together. Uh, so, you know, there's lots of different ways to get involved. The first and most important way is use FTC3, like what workflows do you have at your organization that FTC3 can help you deliver, right? You can go to GitHub, everything we do is in the open, our meeting minutes are in the open, like we've got no secrets, we're all about collaboration, everybody in the industry working together. Uh, our quarterly general meeting is on the 2nd of August, if you want to dip your toes in, that's a great place to start. That's usually where people come and show demos, talk about what's going on at a more like a high level without you being um, maybe asked to actually do something. So if you just want to come and find out, that's a great place to do so. Um, our next standard working group meeting is around the corner. We have those once a month. Um, you know, do come along to that if you're interested. Uh, the context and intense discussion group, as, as Chris explained, will be running probably from 
now into the future, you know, because we need to continue adding those use cases to really uh, leverage the momentum that we've gathered so far. Uh, and then I think in the on stage today, uh, the community page was called out. This is brand new. We're putting all of the resources together, all of the companies involved together, the example apps, the um, talks that people did where you can go and find out how to use FTC3. So if you go to ftc3.finos.org slash community, you, you know, go and look through there. The vendors are there. The solution providers are there. The training um, that uh, on FTC3 specifically that Linux Foundation created recently is, is on there. Uh, you know, there's loads of resources. Uh, and you can be on there as well. If your company is using FTC3, or if you have apps that you want to highlight, if you have workflows you want to advertise, please get in touch with, um, with Finos or with the FTC3 maintainer team, and we'll gladly add you on there. Or oh, do a PR yourself, even better. Right, so, uh, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to close on this. Um, I'm going to, now we're going to practice getting involved with FTC3, right? Uh, so you need to go on your phone to, um, you can use the QR code or you can just go to menti.com and put in that uh, code over there. And it's going to ask you like three words that you want to put in, like what should FTC3 tackle next? I think you'll all agree we, um, there's a whole bunch of stuff that's going into 2.0 almost that whole list that I had up about what people were asked for, we were able to put into FTC3, and now we need to know what do we need next, right? So I'm slightly ambitious, because I've now got to go out of my slide deck and hope that works. So let's see. Oh, oh, it's no longer there. Okay, so I'm gonna just exit out of that and see if I can bring it up. I had it earlier, so just give me a moment. Now, this is going to be interesting. Right, so how do I do this? Let me try that. Uh, and let me go to menti.com. that one I think. Hopefully that will do the trick. There we go. Right, so has everybody put in some words? You know, I put in some of my own. Uh, right, I put in lunch. Right, that's certainly <laughs> important. <laughs> okay. If I'm honest. <laughs> So as you as you add more things, you'll you'll see all of them showing up there. So um, I, I think lunch is looking particularly <laughs> attractive to everyone right now. Um, and uh, yeah, trading is a big one that stands out for me. Uh, data standard for objects, uh, discoverability. I don't know homelessness. How if DC three <laughs> helps with that? But we can try. <laughs> um, <laughs> Uh, add an API to get intents. Uh, open telemetry, that's an interesting one. Um, uh, yeah, containers, mobile app directory, security. Cool. Um, I think we, we'll also use this, you know, at, we could use this at our next uh, discussion group to, um, to, to think about more things that we can do, right? Um, and with that, uh, that's the end of our talk. So, uh, yeah, uh, I, I don't know. Do we still have time for questions, or are we done? We're done. We're done. Okay, good. <laughs> but uh, yeah, no, no, I don't want to either. Yeah. So, uh, cool. Thanks, everyone. Thank you, Richard.